Hi, I'm Charlie Kemp. I'm going to talk about mobile cobots as assistive technology. So I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech. I'm also co-founder and CTO of Hello Robot Inc. I have a conflict of interest because in addition to being an associate professor I, at Georgia Tech, I work part-time at Hello Robot. I own equity in Hello Robot. I'm also an inventor of intellectual property at Georgia Tech that Hello Robot licensed. And what this means is that if Hello Robot increases in value, I benefit. Similarly, if Hello Robot sells products, I get a royalty for that, and so I benefit. So today I'm going to be talking about research my lab has conducted since I founded it in 2007. My lab is the Healthcare Robotics Lab at Georgia Tech. And we've focused on a particular type of technology, mobile cobots, or mobile manipulators, robots that can navigate in the world and physically manipulate it. And they are robots that can collaborate with people. They're safe to be around people. And what I'm hoping to convince you of is that mobile cobots can benefit people with disabilities, they can help with a wide variety of tasks, and they could be useful in the near term. And at the bottom of the slide, you see various mobile cobots that my lab has worked with some of which we built ourselves. So there's a big need for physical assistance. People with long-term disabilities require physical assistance on a daily basis. In the US alone, there are 12 million people at least. And the causes for this include disease, injury, or just aging. There are also short-term disabilities. So when people have surgery, often they will have to rest, and that happens more and more at home. And during that time, they require physical assistance, and it can be challenging. And over time, uh, for societies, many societies, developed nations are aging. Their populations are getting older, and because of that, there will be increased demand for assistance and physical assistance on a daily basis, both in terms of long-term disabilities and short-term disabilities. So. In my lab and many others, we like to think of the types of tasks with which people require assistance. It's a useful way of thinking about things. Our two important classes are activities of daily living, which are tasks such as feeding, toileting, transferring, dressing, and hygiene. There are these self-care tasks that are really important for living, and they're also very predictive of an individual's ability to live independently. Another class of tasks, instrumental activities of daily living, IADLs. And this often involves tasks like housework and other things around the home. Notably, for both of these, manipulation plays a role in physical assistance. For the activities of daily living, the assistance is typically near the person's body, which uh, creates particular challenges for robots providing assistance. And for IADLs, for instrumental activities of daily living, it involves manipulation of objects around the environment. Often, if a person wants to age in place, for example, in the home, And robots have particular properties that are beneficial with respect to providing physical assistance. One thing that we've seen a lot in my lab is that they can provide a sense of independence. They can enable an individual to do things for themselves through the robot, which can be really valuable if what you usually have to do is instead just ask people for help. It's just nice to be able to take control of your own world. Another aspect that I'll touch on is that robots are actually preferred for some tasks over human assistance. And then finally, I think in the long term, there's an opportunity for 24-7 personalized assistance, a level of vigilance that currently you'd only get with a team of people, maybe in an ICU. Now, robots take many forms. Uh, they can assist in these various forms, and they each have their strengths and weaknesses and where they really could come into play as assistive devices. So you know, in our work, we focus on mobile cobots, and they're are, I'm going to list like four things that I think are especially interesting about mobile cobots that make them distinctive as assistive devices that are robotic in nature. Uh, first is that a mobile cobot can do a task independently from the user. It's not worn by the user, so it's not attached to the user's body. It's not attached to a wheelchair. It's not fixed to the environment. And so it can go off and do something for the user and then return. The user doesn't have to be involved in all the details. In addition, it doesn't have to be worn. It's not, you know, it's not donned and doffed, like you don't put it on in the morning and take it off at night. And sometimes wearable technology, that, that 
putting it on and taking it off and wearing it can actually be a barrier to adoption. It can also assist, mobile cobots have the potential to assist in diverse users, people in wheelchairs, people in bed, people even when they're ambulatory, when they're walking, could potentially benefit from this assistive technology. Finally, I'm optimistic that in the long term, this type of technology could be a mass market product. And then these assistive, uh, assistive case, use cases could just be applications. Uh, if this were possible and if this happened, there's the potential that we could avoid the uh, high costs of niche assistive devices or medical devices. Uh, whether that's going to happen or not, you know, time, time, time will tell. But we have seen it before. For example, mobile phones and personal computers have our consumer devices. They have high quality and they're low cost, relatively speaking. And yet they're, they've made a really profoundly beneficial impact in the lives of many people with disabilities. So when you're looking at a new assistive technology, a good thing to ask at the start is, you know, are people willing to use it? Are they open to using that assistive technology? Because if they're not open to using it, then that could create challenges. No matter how good the technology is, no matter how uh, good it would be in theory, if people aren't actually going to use it, then it, it's just not going to do much good. So are people open to using mobile cobots? Uh, since 2007, my lab's worked with hundreds of participants or that are, who are representative of the populations who would like to benefit from, from the technology. And I, I've been really surprised by how positive people have been about this type of assistive technology, how enthusiastic they've been it, just in general. And I'm going to give you a specific case, which is older adults. We found that older adults are open to assistance from mobile cobots. Uh, for example, in this work, which was in collaboration with Professor Wendy Rogers and her lab, uh, we conducted a study with 21 older adults in the Atlanta area. The thing to note about this is that it was a very carefully designed study. Uh, Professor Rogers had, and her lab has great expertise in this area. And that I'm going to shortly present the results of surveys from these participants. Prior to filling out those responses, they had seen video of real mobile manipulators, real mobile cobots doing various tasks, and they'd had discussions about it so that they're actually informed. They're not just basing their opinions on science fiction or movies they've seen. They're grounded in some existing technologies. And interestingly, what we found is that people stated they would prefer robots for some tasks. So for example, finding and delivering items people tended to say they'd prefer a robot's help versus a human's help. Similarly, with laundry, they say they prefer a robot's help over human help. Now, I would say the thing to take away from this is that people were discerning. The older adults, it mattered what task it was. Because, for example, with preparing meals in this group, people stated they'd prefer human assistance over robotic assistance. Now, the specifics about whether these would hold for lots of populations and different robots and what their understanding is, I think are less important than recognizing that whether someone's going to be open to assistance from a mobile cobot really depends on what task you're talking about and the way in which they will interact and that people are discerning. Another study that we conducted in collaboration with Wendy Rogers, Professor Wendy Rogers and her lab was studying how people responded when they received medicine that had been autonomously delivered by a robot in a home-like environment. Now, this study also involved uh, RFID technology so that the robot would find the older adult who's wearing an RFID tag. And the notion behind the technology was to try to deliver the right medicine to the right person at the right time. Now, interestingly, prior to actually having the robot deliver medicine and experiencing that, people were unsure about the technology. You can see in the statistics here that some people said they would only want assistance from a human for this task. Yet after actually working with the robot, people's preferences tended to become more, people tend to become more open to robotic assistance. And you'll see that after working with the robot, no one said that they would only want assistance from a human and many said they would have no preference. So that's a good sign for the technology is that after experiencing it, they're more open to it. 
once again, just highlighting, it depends on the task though. So for example, when asked about having a robot help them actually take the medicine, the statistics of the responses were unchanged after having worked with the robot. It's another study with older adults. So this is uh, dancing with a robot. It's, uh, that's uh, Dr. Tiffany Chen, or she wasn't a, hadn't earned her PhD yet, but this was part of her PhD work. And so older adults in this study, they, they danced with the robot and the robot was running, it was a partner dance. And the reason, the motivation behind this is that one of our collaborators, Professor Madeline Hackney, she has demonstrated or shown that therapeutic dance, partner dance between humans has ther therapeutic benefit for a number of groups. And so in this collaboration, Professor Lena Ting, Professor Madeline Hackney, Professor Wendy Rogers in my lab, uh, Tiffany Chen was the lead student, has earned her PhD, as, uh, this was part of her PhD work. Uh, what we found is that after having danced with the robot, people perceived it as being useful, they perceived it as being easy to use, and they found it enjoyable. And interestingly, after using the technology, they perceived it as being easier to use than prior to using the technology. So that's also a positive thing. In terms of the technology involved here, it was a simple admittance controller where the velocity of the mobile base was proportional to the force applied to these compliant arms. Uh, as a personal anecdote, this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. I'm not uh, used to working with dancing. Uh, and uh, I kind of dragged my feet on actually trying it out. But uh, late in the process, I finally tried it out. And uh, it was fun. It was simple, but I enjoyed it. So I, I do really think there's potential here to, uh, to benefit older adults and others. So summary so far. First, there is a need for physical assistance. And second, people are open to receiving assistance from mobile cobots. So now what I want to focus on is ways in which mobile cobots could help. And I'm, a lot of this is going to involve Henry Evans and Jane Evans, who you see here in this picture. My lab has collaborated with them for over a decade now, uh, and they've been fantastic. They've, they've really... Uh, They've been great collaborators. They've attend uh, for a period. They would attend our weekly lab meetings. It's been fantastic working with them. Uh, Henry, uh, unfortunately, had a brainstem stroke, and he has severe quadriplegia. He has movement of his head and the finger, but uh, he requires daily assistance. And Jane, his wife and primary caregiver, helps him. He's also unable to speak. But he is able to use a computer. So a head tracker tracks his head. That moves a cursor. And then if you can see, he's moving his thumb to click a mouse button. So between his head tracker and that mouse button, he's able to operate a computer. So the first uh, approach I'll show for enabling robots to help is teleoperation via augmented re reality. And Phil Grice, who earned a PhD with me. He worked with Henry in an iterative process for five years to create a web-based interface that would enable Henry to control a sophisticated mobile cobot. In this case, he's drive Henry's driving it. Well, actually, I don't think Henry's driving it, but some of this shows how he could. Those red dots are where the tactile sensing skin made contact to show the operator where contact is occurring. It also included uh, these augmented reality elements and interfaces to enable Henry to manipulate objects in the environment. And this is a web-based interface. So if you have access to a web browser and can control that, you can control the robot. So as part of this study, towards the end of it, uh, Phil and others in my lab gave Henry in his home access, free access to the robot, this PR2 mobile manipulator, it's a type of mobile cobot, for a period of seven days. And Henry did many different tasks for himself using the robot. And you can see some of those tasks here. And this is a video of some of those, uh, some examples. So for example, Henry was able to feed himself some yogurt 
while he was in bed using the interface I showed you and this mobile cobot. Uh, it has fabric-based tactile sensing skin on his arm, you might notice. Henry, this is a task he wanted to do. He wanted to be able to apply lotion to his legs while in bed because they become dry. So Henry's controlling the robot to do that. Now this is especially exciting because Henry came up with this all on his own. None of us had thought of this ahead of time, but because Henry could control the robot and explore its use, he came up with this where he would just for hours at a time have the two arms out, brush so he could scratch his head because he gets itchy, and a cloth so he could wipe his mouth. And I think that's especially exciting when you empower people to help themselves and to explore things for themselves, they can discover new ways to use technology that people prior to them haven't thought of. Of course, it's important not for just Henry to benefit. Henry and Jane and our team, we really want others to benefit as well. And so Phil led a study with 15 participants from across the United States. And what they would do is they would use their web browser to control a robot in our lab to perform a clinical assessment. Now this shows you, the people in this study are similar, similarly impaired with respect to, uh, compared to Henry. Uh, this is a person with severe impairments from across the country controlling the robot in our lab to perform this clinical assessment of man manipulation skills. And that's uh, Phil Grice who earned his PhD with this work in the background. So the people in the study, their motor and severe motor impairments were from a variety of causes, which you can see listed here. Notably, they all shared uh, this. They all were uh, similarly impaired in the sense that they would perform very poorly at this manipulation test were they to try to perform the test unaided. Uh, it's also worth noting that the people in this study would be likely to qualify for participating in a study where they would surgically implant a brain computer interface as a, as a chip, which is a highly invasive and, and dangerous sort of procedure. The thing that's really exciting about this approach by using web-based interface and adhering to these standards, people in the study were able to use what their preferred computer access device was. Something, things that they've used, or devices they've used for years in order to access the web and access the internet. You can see here like trackball, uh, eye gaze, speech. Thing to note about this is the power of taking advantage of these standards. So society has invested a lot into enabling people with disabilities to access the web, the internet, their computers using assisted devices through a mouse style interface. So by having a, a web-based interface, it plugs into that and takes advantage of all this progress that's been made. By using a, a modified, uh, but adhering as closely as possible to uh, this clinical assessment, this ARAT, uh, we were able to estimate what's called a minimal clinically important difference, whether that was exceeded. And what I mean by this is that we compared how people would perform on the test if they performed it unaided versus how they performed on the test using the robot. And that difference, the improvement in what they could do in the world by using the robot, was that a significant enough difference to have a meaningful benefit in their lives? And by using this clinical test, we, had, we gained evidence that in fact it would provide a meaningful dis difference in their lives to have this robot and to be able to perform those, those tasks. They also perceived the system as useful, both in terms of manipulation tasks and self-care tasks, which are sort of related to IADLs and the ADLs, instrumental activities of day living uh, <laughs> activities of day living. They also perceived it as easy to use for both manipulation tasks and self-care tasks. It's worth noting though that peop people did not, no one filled in the seven. They never strong, they didn't strongly agree with it being easy to use. So there are challenges with using this system. And yet people were sufficiently successful to feel that it was worthwhile and easy to use. So the main limitations of this approach are that it's slow operation. You may have noticed some of the videos were 40x, so sped up 40 times. And also people had a tendency to make errors. Uh, so those are things that what I'm going to talk about now are approaches to overcoming slow operation and errors. 
It's also worth noting that even though it's slow operation errors, this could type of system could still have benefit to could still benefit people. So for example, Henry, you know, he's made he's noted to us many times that look, he's got time. And for him to be able to take control of his world has value. I'll also notice, you know, at this point I've teleoperated lots of robots. They're uh, pretty much always slower than I could do things on my own. However, when I'm when I'm doing these teleoperation and teleoperating the robot, I'm engaged. It doesn't feel like it's taking a long time. It's kind of like a weird video game trying to manipulate the world that's, uh, you know, far away. So. Approaches for overcoming slow operation and errors. How could we overcome that? Well, the main approach we've taken in my lab is task-specific applications that incorporate autonomy. And so, yeah, what do, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that for given a specific tasks that would be valuable to people, find ways for robots and humans to collaborate at that task, where the robot has some autonomy and the human does what they do well. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of tasks. Uh, and it might be a little bit overwhelming, but it'll give you a sense of the breadth of the work that my lab has done. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about more general, like what about autonomous, this is autonomous behaviors via augmented reality programming. So enabling people to program tasks and that are small tasks that have autonomous elements. So uh, this is PR2, it's in Henry Evans' home, and Henry was able to take the, the robot through the house and say, okay, use this drawer opening behavior here and associate with that marker, that black and white tag that's on the drawer. And then Henry can say, okay, go open that, and the robot would autonomously go over to it and open it. There's also a behavior for opening the refrigerator. Now this was more you know, specialized to that refrigerator. I wouldn't count on that working on lots of different refrigerators. And it was also associated with one of these tags in the environment. So this is a way of automating his, was a way for him to automate his home. And you can see the tag there. He also had a way of automatically operating the light switch. And there were a number of other tasks as well. So the, this is a, a, going to be a quick view of what the interface was like. This is dissertation work of Hai Nu Nguyen. And, uh, it's, it's the thing that I think is really powerful about this is it's sort of Photoshop. We thought of it as Photoshop for robots. It's to enable people to, to, who are not robotic experts to program robots. And what you'll see is it's got a visual interface with uh, hierarchical finite state machines. And notably, you program the robot with the robot in the loop. So it's always easy to visualize what the robot is perceiving and to test the robots, whatever your current code is on the robot. So it's a highly integrated system. So now let's just watch it. Okay, so in this case, you position this task frame at the door handle so that, and then you, you give it this motion, and this is in order to teach it and program how to open drawers. And it's with respect to that, that frame of reference. And now you can test it. In this case, that the real robot is actually running this, these behaviors to try to open the drawer. When you want to retarget this capability, what you do is you drive it, and then you'd position that task frame, that frame of reference, with respect to the tag. And here's another behavior. This is for the refrigerator opening behavior, and positioning your deploy. This is for deploying the behavior, and the person is placing that frame of reference on the handles of the refrigerator so that now the robot can can play back that behavior and open the refrigerator. Uh, Hai Nguyen is uh, <laughs> he's a creative person, so I love this. He actually took this uh, $400,000 robot, created a web app, and uh, created a massaging behavior so that he could massage himself. And my understanding is it worked pretty well. I love, yeah, this is especially opulent to have this very expensive robot fanning. Uh, hi, hi is great. Hi, Nguyen. Doc, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, really appreciate his work. And I think that also, that speaks to, in the long term, when uh, this technology becomes more accessible and lower cost, 
there's a possibility for all sorts of interesting ways of using it that uh, in an academic lab you might not usually pursue. Okay, another task, object retrieval. So this is first robot, my mobile cobot, my lab created. It's Ellie, this is 2008. Uh, this is in collaboration with the Emory ALS Center. And a person with ALS is commanding that robot by using a laser pointer. And it's basically like virtual buttons. So what she did was she clicked on the phone and then the robot interpreted, oh, I'm supposed to pick it up. And then she clicks on herself using laser pointer and the robot interprets that as meaning I should deliver it to her. If she had clicked on a surface, it would have placed the object on the surface. And this is a visualization of, of how the system worked, uh, that there would be these various like virtual buttons, and then you would click on them with the laser pointer to do different tasks, such as you know, click on a, on a door handle, the robot goes and opens the door, light switch, the robot operates the light switch. You know, as we worked more with people with ALS, we found that if we could just have a robot that would pick up dropped objects, it would be valuable. And we did a study to better understand what objects people would want a robot to retrieve. And uh, what we found is that most of the objects were small and lightweight, which allowed us to develop a specialized end effector so robots could pick them up and deliver them to people. And just to give you a bit of perspective on why this is important, you know, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, you lose, progressively lose the ability to move your body. And so you start losing dexterity in your hands and you're more likely to drop an object. And then you also are unable to recover the object for yourself. And when we did a study, some people, you know, an object would be, they drop an object and be on the floor for 30 minutes because someone's not around to help them. And also just in general, you know, if you are dropping objects frequently, it can be really frustrating to have to feel like you're a burden on your family by asking uh, a loved one or informal caregiver to help you and pick up an object anytime you drop one. So people would really like, you know, expressed strong interest in a robot that would pick up objects for them. So anyway, here's the, here's the specialized end effector that we developed to autonomously grasp objects. It's just open loop, and yet it works remarkably well for the top 25 objects as prioritized by people with ALS. And you see it gets a small, small pill. We test on lots of different floors. We're very happy with the, the outcome. Uh, this is at the Emory ALS Center, and people with ALS actually used this full mobile manipulator that integrated this special end effector, this special kind of hand. They would retrieve objects for themselves. You, the results were really strong quantitatively, but I think the, the expressions on their faces are, uh, communicate a lot. Now, something that's nice about that is a simple interface, just a joystick with two buttons. One button is pick up the object in front of the robot, the other button was lift up that object, which is on this tray after being grasped, which is easy to, to pick up an object from, to an ADA compliant height. And then the joystick to drive it around. Next task, robot assisted hygiene. So this is a task that Henry and Jane really wanted us to explore. So we created this system to enable Henry to shave himself in his own home. This first part of it, the robot autonomously drives to a predefined pose with respect to that tag on his wheelchair. Henry's always in control. He's always supervising things. Now, Henry's able to play back trajectories so the arms would position the mirror and the electric shaver in appropriate positions. Then he clicked on his, he would click on his face, which would help the robot fit a 3D model to his face, which would then enable him to say, I'd like to shave my chin, or shave my cheek, and then the robot would move the electric shaver to that area and then would monitor the forces as he was shaving. And if the forces got too high, it would back off. And Henry was able to use this successfully to shave in his own home. One interesting aspect of this is when we first tested it out, uh, yeah, there were, Henry got nicks and abrasions and there was blood. And you never want to see that when you're conducting a study. It was uh, a bit distressing for all of us. Although Henry was gung ho, uh, as he usually is, so we we looked more into it. And what we found was that Henry would apply a high force to himself, while Jane, when she would shave Henry, would apply a low force. And if I remember correctly, it was around 25 newtons that Henry would apply to himself. So just to be clear, 
The electric shaving system would only hold the shaver near Henry's face. He was responsible for pushing against it. So that's maybe around 25 newtons for him. And then when Jane was using it, I think maybe she was in the three newton range. So a huge difference. So we went back to lab. We conducted a study with able-bodied participants where they used a motion capture and force capture system to shave themselves. And what we found is 10 newtons should be enough for anyone to shave themselves. Um, so we went back, we set a force threshold. If it was above 10 newtons, the robot would pull back and retract the electric shaver. And after we had that in there, Henry didn't get nicks and abrasions again. The thing I like to point out about this is how one of the challenges for robotic caregivers is that they don't have common sense. If I gave an electric shaver to one of you in the audience and you were to help someone shave, you would not, I'm confident, allow someone to apply 25 newtons to him or herself. It just wouldn't be reasonable. It would be, it'd be clear that this violates your personal experience with this sort of task. Robots, on the other hand, they just don't have any experience. They don't have any common sense, and they will let you do something or let something occur, which is just obviously wrong. So in this approach, this is one approach to giving robots common sense about sort of the forces that are associated with the task, and that's to have them observe the task through motion and force capture, collect data, and then based on that data, have expectations about what is appropriate for a given task. For example, another part of this was that it figured out where, where does the shaving make, where do people make contact between the shaver and their faces? Notably, they didn't make contact with the eyes. Obvious for us as, as humans who have experienced these things and have this understanding and this common sense, but for a robot, I don't know, shaving the eyes, why not? Another task, robot-assisted feeding. Uh, so this, this is a, a semi-autonomous system for feeding that Henry was able to use to feed himself yogurt in his own home. And you know, the robot had actions for scooping, for wiping the spoon, for finding Henry's mouth and moving it into it. Uh, you can see here an example. This was a dissertation. This dissertation, part of the dissertation work of Daehyung Park, who's shown here. Uh, the robot has an estimate of the mouse, so it could actually put the food right, deliver the food right to the mouth. And also the robot is able to perceive the food within the bowl in order to do a better job scooping. Of course, we want more than just Henry to, to benefit. That's Henry and Jane feel that way too. And so uh, we conducted a study with many people with disabilities in our lab. Uh, this is uh, also part of Daehyung Park's dissertation work, and it was a success. It worked. People appreciated it. Now, another part of Daehyung's dissertation was on trying to give robots more common sense, robotic caregivers, and he developed many methods for trying to estimate when things aren't right based on data-driven and data of previous success in the task. So I started out with hidden Markov models and eventually at the end was using a variational autoencoder. So this is an example of data of anomalies just for, for testing. So uh, I think it will be obvious to you that these are not right. Here we go. Not sure you heard the sound, but it was pretty dramatic. Bedside is it? Oh, yeah, it's also worth mentioning Henry, when he used the system in his home, apparently the system did detect two real anomalies and halted as expected. Bedside assistance. So Henry spends a lot of time in bed, and so that's one of the reasons we really wanted to consider this area. So, uh, Ari Kapusta in the back, this was part of his dissertation work, and his system would enable the, the mobile cobot and this bed, which is a robotic bed, to collaborate to provide assistance. And there's this handoff. Henry says, I want to wipe my face. The bed and the mobile cobot work together to get things ready for him, and then they hand off control of him so that Henry 
can deal with the details and where, where his preferences are especially important. Here's another, Henry says, I want to move my uh, blanket. The robotic bed lifts up because it knows that that enables the, this mobile cobot to get underneath it and to reach the location better. And it's, this is all autonomous, and now it hands off control to Henry so that he can deal with the dexterous details and also his preferences of manipulating the covers. So Henry's in control now. This is an illustration of a task model. This is a task model for shaving that this optimization system would use. Each one of those red arrows is a pose of the tool or the end effector of the robot. And the optimization would attempt to find poses of the bed, the person, and the mobile cobot that would enable the mobile cobot to move the tool to all of these locations with high dexterity. It also actually, the system could enable the robot, for example, a shaving to find two poses so that it would be both on the right side and the left side of the person in order to cumulatively reach all of the task targets. When testing it in Henry's home, the model ended up being relatively complex. This is the model that we used. Something that's very notable about it is that there's the, there are these rays that are going from the head, and that represents Henry's interface. Because when we first tested it out with Henry, what we found is that the robot would sometimes move its arm in between Henry's head and his computer monitor, and notably his head tracker. And then this would all of a sudden prevent him from controlling the robot, which is clearly something we want to avoid. So by having that modeled, the, the plans that it would come up with would make it so that the robot would avoid interfering with Henry's uh, interface. Another aspect of this that we took seriously the notion that the bed is a robot, so it also had sensor, it had this skin. It was a tactile sensing array across its base. And based on that, it could estimate the pose of the person's body, which then the mobile cobot could use. And that's especially valuable because mobile cobot, sensors on the mobile cobot, there it can have difficulty seeing what's going on with the human body because there's bedding, overbed table, or if it's a hospital, could be IV lines. This pressure sensing array has this nice view that is uh, not so, uh, it's not dependent on those other things on top, whereas the cameras on the mobile cobot, line of sight is occluded and blocked. Last task I'm gonna talk about, and it is the most difficult task, that's robot assisted dressing. There's a long ways to go in the robot assisted dressing. A lot of the tasks I've shown you before this, I, I really believe the technology is there today to be provide meaningful assistance for this task, we're not really there yet. So what I'm gonna show you is kind of a demonstration of where we are now, some of the progress we've made. Why is robot assisted dressing difficult? Well, for one, it's complex physics, you know, fabric and materials, uh, one type of model for them would have sort of infinite dimensions in terms of, you know, it could be a continuum, you can move it and change it in all sorts of ways. It's also, it's complex cooperation to actually dress a person for many situations, either the robot's gonna to have to move the person's body or the person's gonna to have to cooperate with the robot physically, sometimes in sort of a complex coordinated motion to end up dressed. So also there are risks of inju injury. We, you know, we tend to take it for granted that, oh, you know, it doesn't seem that dangerous, this cloth I have on my body. But if you, you know, if you spin it around, it can become kind of like a tourniquet. If you pull it taut, it can actually uh, strangle someone. So, uh, it's surprisingly risky when manipulating fabrics around a person's body. And then finally, another challenge is visual occlusion. A lot of robots use visual perception, and yet for dressing, we often are dressing in part to visually occlude our body. And that means that line of sight sensors are gonna have difficulties seeing what's important, which is the state of the cloth, where is the cloth, and where is the person's body? That all of a sudden becomes a challenge. So an additional challenge in that for dressing assistance, the robot is really close to the person and the robot's arms are often occluding the task, which presents additional challenges. So the work I'm gonna focus on is work we did where our approach is to find a personalized solution based on what a person is capable of doing. So the notion is for an individual, find out what their capabilities are, 
What is their range of motion? What limitations do they have? And then based on that model of the person, search computationally for a plan, a collaborative plan that will enable the robot and the person to work together to get the person dressed. A nice aspect of this is that after it's found a solution, it's able to present the, this plan to the person as sort of instructions about here's how you use the robot, here's how you and the robot can work together to become dressed. The thing I like about this is often people tend to focus in the research academics to, they focus on the robot learning and teaching the robot to do things. But a lot of times, you know, the human is going to be more adaptive and more able to be taught. Uh, and so this takes advantage of that by providing automatically generating instructions for the person as opposed to having the robot try to, to change what it's going to do. So here's video from actually testing the system. Uh, by the way, this was in collaboration with Professor Karen Loom, Professor Greg Turk. I've done a lot of work I'm excited about on robot assisted dressing. It was also part of uh, Ari Kapusta's dissertation work. So in this case, uh, it's giving assistance with dressing unimpaired arm. There's another trick here, which is that the robot has a capacitive sensor, which enables it, and this is another innovation from my lab that uh, Zachary Erickson has led, which enables the robot to sense where the, the human body is and adapt its plans to the, the actual motions of the human body and to track the, the limbs. Now, this is interesting because this person only really want, only wanted robotic assistance dressing her unimpaired limb. And I think that's fairly common. Now, uh, this individual has some involuntary motion. And so in this case, that capacitive sensor that in effect adapts this plan, collaborative plan to those involuntary motions becomes more important. So that's, that's the main body of my talk. I've talked about mobile cobots as assistive devices. And I hope I've convinced you that they can benefit people with disabilities, they can help with a wide variety of tasks, and they could be useful in the near term. Now after this, if I have convinced you, you might be saying, well, what's the catch? Why aren't people benefiting today if this is, these statements are actually true? And I would say my main answer to that would be that you know the details matter. So the robot that we used for a lot of the work I just showed you was released in 2010, and it originally cost $400,000, about the cost of a house, 500 pounds, and very large, you know, 2.2 feet wide. So those details are a real barrier to the technology actually being used. 